You are listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Welcome back. Welcome to a fresh week. I'm so glad that you're here and that we're spending this time together, and I'm thrilled to share the work of my guest with you today. His name is Eugene Merman. He's an actor and comedian, and you probably know him best from his work on Bob's Burgers. He's the voice of Gene, but he's also been working well over 20 years on the comedy scene, and so every major comedian that you've seen in TV and movies has probably worked with Eugene in some fashion. Um, But we're here today to talk about his new documentary that's out. It's called It Started as a Joke, and it chronicles uh, the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival, which literally started as a joke. And so he talks about his journey with that. He talks about growing up and getting into comedy and connection. Um, And then we also talk about, as you'll see in the documentary, about the loss of his wife and mother of his child uh, through cancer. And so we really talk about legacy and life and what it means to leave behind a legacy. And I think this is just such a conversation on the rawness and the reality and the sadness of life and how comedy is so often um, juxtaposed next to that and how they both kind of work together in some strange way towards healing. Um, So I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, please share it out with at least one friend. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and truly... Thank you for listening, and thank you for sharing the work of Eugene Merman. This episode is sponsored by Motherhood Unstressed CBD. Pick up your third-party tested organic CBD products at motherhoodunstressed.com. Well, hello, Eugene. Welcome to the show. I am so honored that you're here. I love your work. Um, I'm so excited to dive into that, Uh, so welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so rather than diving into your great body of work immediately, I'm always fascinated with origin stories. So I'm curious, how did a little boy from communist Russia end up as a central driver in modern American comedy? Um, I I don't know if that's how I present it, but um, (laughs) I grew up loving stand-up. You know, I watched a lot of stand-up as a kid. Um, You know, in the 80s, it was really popular and I, and I loved it. And then I think at some point, you know, realized that that was like a type of job some people had. And so right after high school, I had, uh, I tried it. Like I signed up for an open mic, um, at a club in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Catch a Rising Star. And I did that. And then, and I sort of, and then I went to a college where you could design your own major. And so I designed the major of comedy, and did a one hour stand up act as my thesis and sort of other like took classes in like uh, acting and writing and history and film and sociology and a lot of sort of different things um, to kind of create this major. And but then, you know, uh, did a sort of stand up show and then kind of kept doing that. Um, so it was more, it was just something that I basically had always really liked and then pursued since I was a kid. Yeah. And that's really, it's really atypical. I think, you know, so many people follow a traditional path and they do what they're told. What was it about you that went this other way? I mean, you literally created your own major. Well, I went to a school where everyone in a sense, where everyone created their own major. Um, but I wasn't told to do something else, you know? So, so in that sense, I think my, you know, I mean, I think part of it was my, our parents, you know, my parents brought me and my brother here sort of for the purpose that we could do something that we wanted and, and, you know, have a free life. Um, so I think that they were, you know, supportive of me trying to pursue comedy, even though that is not probably like, I guess the wisest profession. I don't really know. I mean, <laughs> I think they were fine with me doing something that I liked. And I think that was sort of, I think they wanted me to be invested in it. Um, uh, so yeah, I was also a terrible student in high school. So I think just going to college was already its own, like, they were happy with that. They were were pretty happy in that, like, you know, and in the end, like lots of people have a liberal arts degree, you know, and so mine is essentially in stand up, but you know, it could just as well be in English. And I think they're probably both is helpful. I mean, I don't know. I ended up doing stand up, so I guess it's fine. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, and it is unusual for immigrant parents to be so open and supportive. So that's really, you were really blessed yeah. by that. Yes. And not to say that they weren't very anxious, um, just that they weren't like, you should probably just be a lawyer. Um, so, so yeah, I, 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 you know, they were very supportive, but, but also I think as worried as I was about whether it would work out. 
Do you remember the first time that you did a comedy show and it was successful? Like you felt the energy from the crowd, how that felt in your body. Do you remember that first time? Yes, it was. I mean, it was essentially the first time. Most people, when they do stand up for the first time, the audience knows that it's their first time and they are very warm and receptive. So the first time I did it, a lot of friends from high school came. It was right after high school. Um, and it was really fun. I was extremely anxious. Like I was shaking on stage and I was really nervous. Um, but it went well, I guess, in that people laughed a lot and it was really fun. Um, though really just, you know, so anxious. Um, and then the next time I did it at that same club and then it was like, and, and eventually a lot of clubs, like it closed maybe six months after, not, not, through any fault of my own. Um, but then the <laughs> second time I did it was like not, it was very bad. And I was like, oh, I see. It's like, it gets, uh, it goes up and down. Well, I was going to say, that's something that I learned from your documentary. It started as a joke. Like you have to workshop these jokes and workshop your material to really fine tune it. Um, so it must've been those early experiences that, that taught you that. Yes. I mean, and then every time you do it, sort of, if you're doing something new, it might fail. I think that what you learn over time is to, is that it's fine if a joke doesn't work. So, so yeah. So I think like over time you learn that it's okay and you move on or whatever, but um, yes, but there isn't, but everyone tries stuff and you know, you, you get thing, you keep trying different versions of a thing until you have it working and then it generally works, you know, overall. Does it, does it, does something ever never really work out? Or, you, or do you ever just like throw something away and you're like, you know, no. <laughs> uh, there's stuff that you think is funny that you can never figure out how to sort of get across what you think is funny about it. But sometimes you'll think of, you know, I know lots of people who like think of a punchline to a thing, you know, in, two years later, or they'll look back to their notebook and they'll see a new way of looking at it. So, so I think, um, yeah, you discard lots of stuff. There's endless jokes that are like, this is nonsense or it's unclear or it's sort of funny, but like, you know, not, not neither here nor there. Um, or there's things that you work out that you eventually get to really work, you know? Hmm. So let's talk about your documentary. I watched it. Sure. It was amazing. It was hilarious and, and touching and sad and all of the things. Um, but talk to us about the comedy festival itself, the Eugene Merman Festival. How did it start? Well, it was me and uh, Julie Smith, Clem, who directed the movie, did a weekly show in Brooklyn at Union Hall um, for, for many years. And um, I think one night after a show, me and her and Mike Birbiglia were joking around. And I, for some reason, said that I was going to do a Eugene Merman comedy festival. Like there was some reason that I made the joke that I was going to do a comedy festival uh, just with my name. And, uh, and then we sort of moved on. And then I think as we, Julie and I talked about it more, she would, she produced the show and, and directed the movie and then eventually produced the festival. So we sort of thought like, Oh, why don't we, you know, try it once there was basically at the time, the people who ran union hall were opening a new club, were opening a new club called bell house. And so we sort of were, I think one of their very first events there. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically we did this sort of one-off thing and got a bunch of friends to do it and it was really fun. And, you know, I think we thought that would be it, but then sort of a few months later, we kind of thought about doing a second one and then kept doing it for 10 years. Yeah. And your network of comedians is just, it's incredible. It's almost hard to believe, but I guess it makes sense because it is such a small network of artists and creatives. Um, how did that grow over time to where you guys actually enjoyed working together? It wasn't a competitive feel at all. How did you grow your network like that? I mean, it's a really beautiful connection of friendships. Well, I think that's, I mean, so a lot of the people in it are just people uh, that I've known and worked with for now decades. Um, but, you know, you, that is sort of how it all you know, that world of comedy in New York is sort of like a lot of different people have um, shows they run and friends and you tour together and you travel together. You know, so many of those people I've traveled around America with and some have done shows and, you know, abroad, um, you know, you, you yeah, that's basically you, you sort of um, it's like working and traveling with people for decades. So, so, so I think it, it's, it feels very normal in that that's like, most of your nights are spent at going to different places, trying to get jokes to work to eventually go on tour with. 
Yeah. It's a very strange existence though, isn't it? I mean, it's completely different than, you know, the majority of the population. You live in a completely different uh, stratosphere, really. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's like, it's the only thing I know. So in fact, all I know is lots and lots of people who do that. Um, But yes, it's probably different from, from, from other jobs as anything is different from itself. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the musician, you know, I know so many musicians and comedians that, that, and and actors who like go somewhere and film movies. So, so I think it's, you know, um, it's the only thing I've sort of known largely, though I, though I have, do I did spend many years temping <laughs> in <laughs> random sort of ice cream parlors. Okay. So you say that though, but then how do you relate so well? Because comedy is, is such a connector. And, and as you say in the film, it is, you know, so many people are experiencing loneliness and comedy is a way to connect us and bring us together and bring us joy. How do you do that when you do live a different existence really than most people? How do you touch them? Well, I mean, I did at one point, but now, but then my existence sort of changed for other reasons. I mean, I don't know. I think like I'm still mad at things like, things still happen to me like they happen to everyone else. Like I'm just like the difference between my job and someone else's is that I've been to, you know, almost every state, (laughs) but, but, uh, you know, I don't know that my, like, you know, lots of people go to places and things happen that are frustrating. I think the answer is, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You can totally say that here. That's totally fine. And now a quick break with a word from our sponsor. And this episode is sponsored by Best Fiends. And what is Best Fiends? Well, it's a puzzle game that you can play right from your phone. It's an app that you just download. And I cannot tell you how fun it has been. And it's such a great alternative to endlessly scrolling on social media. I know we're all home right now. We're all in quarantine. So to have something that actually challenges your brain and gets you out of that scrolling deep pit, I think is really, really helpful. And you can feel good that you're actually doing something that you know engages your brain on another level. Um, it's also visually stimulating with its bright colors and cute characters and best fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events. So it never gets old. So it's a great game to engage your brain and I do it with my kids. They love it. So engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me with over a hundred million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download best fiends free on the Apple app store or Google play. And that's friends without the R best fiends. Fiends. Um, but let's talk about that. In the film, um, it is revealed about halfway through that your girlfriend and then she turned into your fiance and wife um, struggling with cancer. Um, how important to you was that to have that in the film, to document that, that time? Well, so I think it was a few things. One was when we sort of wanted to document the end of the festival, part of the reason it was ending was that you know, I had moved and that Katie had cancer and that, you know, that, and Julie had also moved to to Massachusetts as well. We just, it both became unfeasible to do the festival in New York. And then also just our lives had changed. Um, So I think that the part of it was also that Katie, you know, sort of was, was very comfortable with it. And then in, in the end also, the fact that we could kind of make this movie about Katie and I and have this thing be there for Ollie was sort of a big motivation for both Katie and I, you know, to me, I, you know, I know that it's about the festival, but to me, it's sort of, you know, very much this sort of like document of Katie, um, you know, for me and for Ollie and, and for everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. And it definitely came across. I mean, you still obviously are laughing at the, the comics and their jokes and your relationship and you're like, uh, as someone just watching it as an observer, you're eating that up. But then this greater storyline underneath is so beautiful and really captures your relationship. Um, and so if, if you watching that yourself, was that hard to watch? Was it hard to see that? Or have you watched it? I, I, I've watched it in the, over the last year, like it's played at festivals and, and I've gone and watched it. I actually haven't watched it in the last, like I haven't watched it since Katie died. Um, but I probably will in the coming months, but I don't know when. Yeah. It was so well done. So beautiful. So how has life been, um, under quarantine, especially with your son, Ollie, I, I noticed on Instagram, you're doing a lot more cooking, uh, more dad stuff. How has that been balancing your artistic life with him? I mean, well, I, I, I mean, it's funny cause I've always done a lot of cooking, but I, but I, yes, I guess I haven't posted much of it before. <laughs> um, I mean, 
you know, obviously there's no stand up, like, so I'm not doing that in terms of, you know, work related things. I'm largely doing interviews to do with the movie. And then, you know, we were recording, you know, some things for Bob's Burgers, you know, so, so some of that is happening, but, but mostly like stuff at home that they're using, like, like, you know, tweaking little lines here and there. Um, so, 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 you know, it's more like just getting from day to day, you know, for me, um, than I, you know, but, but yeah, doing some, some amount of work writing, I guess, but not, you know, I don't know when, I don't know when I can be in a room with a hundred people telling jokes, you know, my guess is it'll be in a year and some number of months before that happens, but maybe people can get together in a field and tell jokes. I guess we'll see. <laughs> I think that's kind of brilliant, actually. Um, well, or you could just come to Georgia because we actually opened up the entire state last yes. week. So yeehaw. If I did want to take an incredibly terrible risk <laughs> come to your yeah. regulated state. <laughs> This is true. But going back to your writing, you know, do you have a particular process? Because I feel like, I mean, watching you, hearing your jokes, watching your stuff on YouTube, like there is this, this hilarity, but underneath it's like this sense of warmth and love and connection. Do you have that? Do you write that into the jokes intentionally or does it just happen? I mean, it's probably a mix, meaning like, I think, I, I think some of it, I'm probably, that is possibly an in, intent. And then some of it, I think it's just more I mean, again, a lot of jokes is trial and error. So you think of something and you think of what's funny to you and you think of how to convey it and then you um, perform it. And if people laugh, then it works and it becomes part of your act. And if it doesn't, you keep changing it. So, you know, I think it's more what what, what ends up, like what I think is funny and, how, and what works on stage, you know. Mm. So. Would you ever write a book on how to do comedy, how to do stand-up? Um... <laughs> Probably not, but I would, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, meaning I, and when I say I wouldn't rule it out, I mean like I would make it a small portion of a book about something else. Um, I mean, I would just tell people, I mean, the funny part about stand up is it's not, there's no, it's not a secret. You just, uh, perform as much as you can and keep changing jokes until they work and people are laughing. And then there's no real substitute for just doing that over and over. Um, so I don't know. There's probably like other stuff you could do, but mostly it's just trial and error for like 10 years and you'll probably be fine. Yeah. And it seems like there's, there's something connecting all of the comedians, like some kind of drive that most people don't have. What, how would you describe that? What is it that, that pull to the stage that you have inside of you? Oh, I don't know. I think for me, it's like really wanting to do comedy and the connection with people laughing at a really silly thing, but I don't know like exactly what somebody else's motivation, but some people also like, you know, I would normally do like one or two shows a night. I would rarely do like five, but there's lots of comedians who would go do five, six, eight shows a night, you know, really like changing a word here and there and, and really, you know, figuring out, you know, sort of the perfect sentence. Um, and I think it's, I think to everyone has like sort of a different thing that they love about it and, and what makes them want to do it. Um, for me, I think it's, yeah, doing something really silly in the connection is probably it. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, you, you've been working in this business for so long. Do you have, you know, this, this idea of a legacy that you want to leave behind? Was this, you know, this festival, was that your legacy? Is something, I don't is something know. coming? I, I, I don't know that I've been the first of all, I would like to not leave anything behind for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> So I have, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I more, mostly think of it as I would like to work on things that I really enjoy with friends and, you know, do projects. And then in the end, however, people look at all of it, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have like a thing of like, he was, he was like the comedian who made the best pasta. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be with how you're going lately. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but yeah, so I don't know that I have a, like a, an, an idea of, of a legacy as much as I'll probably have a, a weird and hopefully enjoyable body of work. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, Katie left a particular legacy through you? Is, is there something that she wanted to leave with the world, um, that she shared either through the documentary or just speaking to you that you would want to share? Um, 
I mean, I think that just sort of the, the way she was as a person, meaning like, you know, we had, you know, so she, she had cancer and then like she, she had like a lumpectomy and chemo and radiation and, and was fine. And then like got it again and then it was terminal, you know? And so she had it for six years, but in those six years, you know, we, we had a, a child through a surrogate. Um, we went on trips and she really lived very much like she, she wasn't dying, you know, to, and, and that, that said with, you know, there were times where she was on a chemo that would really wipe her out for, you know, months. Um, and then times that she would be on a treatment that really, you know, she had some energy and we could, we could go do stuff. And so I think that sort of her just tenacity and, and her kind of like, um, I think just sort of the way that she engaged with, uh, just this, this great sadness was, I was just always so, um, kind of blown away by and, and, and really appreciate. Um, so, yeah. So I think something that, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. And what really struck me, uh, you know, as a mother to make the decision to have a baby knowing, you know, that you do have cancer, that this is coming, I think is such a brave and really honorable thing to do, um, to have that experience, to leave, you know, you yeah. with something, a part of her, a part of you forever. Um, yeah. I mean, if was, yeah, that was, you know, yeah, that's a, a really difficult sort of an impossible thing, but it, we both really wanted to do it. And, you know, I'm really glad that I, yeah, I have now a little boy who really does remind me of her and who, you know, is sort of like a little rascal. I was just going to say, cause kids drive you crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, but he's you know I mean it's been hard and strange and like you know talking with a toddler about death and you know but it's also been all right and he you know is is f fairly resilient and and is doing okay but but also we're all of a sudden in a pandemic so everything is you know um, strange but but okay. Do you ever feel like you know during a, a tough time that she is there with you? Um, no, I think that's one of the sort of hard things is that, um, I have like, I have her memories and, or, um, and I very much, um, you know, think about her a lot, but, but I, but, I, but, you know, I think the hard thing is that she is gone and that is really hard. Um, but I do have sort of a lot of really wonderful memories of her and, and also Ollie and, and we talk about it and, and share them. And, you know, he recently asked, um, he said like, I miss mama. And I was like, I, you know, I miss her too. And he was like, can we draw pictures of her, um, and send them to people uh, around the world so that everyone remembers her? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we can, we can definitely do that. So, you know, in the coming weeks, um, we'll probably do that. Um, so, so I think like she's there like, like that, but in, you know, in a way that is both, um, sad, but also okay. And, you know, um, you know, yeah, I think like the, the memory and her presence in that sense is very much there, but I don't know that I feel like she's there. In Behind the you right now. <laughs> right, right. Yes. <laughs> She would. She used to hide around the house all the time. So no way. Um, yes, and startled me. It was, it was very funny. <laughs> okay, we'll look for signs. You never know. Um, yeah, I, I think that's beautiful. And I think honestly, I think you're doing exactly what Ollie wants to do. You are sharing her her story, her light, her tenacity with the world. I that came across in the documentary. So anyone watching that uh, would feel that too and know her. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Are well, you ready for some rapid fire? Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Comedy is. Uh, enjoyable. I'm grateful for. Um, you know, the, the things that I have and for Ollie. Mm. And lastly, what's something that you've learned in life that you wish someone would have told you earlier on? Um, you know, the funny thing about that is, and somebody asked a similar thing recently, I think the problem is that there's so much that you learn through the experience that I don't think someone telling you like, oh, this thing, like that won't exactly work out. Um, because it's easy to get people to 
tell you what to do. Um, but it's very hard to know what will work for you. So, so I don't know that I have a specific thing that I, that I think like, Oh, I wish somebody had told me to do this. And then that would have saved me nine months. Like, <laughs> like I, 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 I don't know. I mean, not to say that I, I, because I think like so much of what you, so, so because, because having things that don't work are the ways that you figure out what works. So, so it's not that I think that, um, uh, something, you know, was, it was particularly great. I just more like, I think you just need the experiences you have. Yeah. Is there anything you're going to tell Ollie though? Um, Okay. Don't do uh, this. (laughs) Oh yeah. Like, yeah, don't, you know, yeah. Don't try to like blow up a can of Lysol (laughs) or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm sure that I'll have lots of advice. I, I just mean, I don't know what to go and tell myself in the past, but I'm sure that for Ollie, I'll be like, yes, yeah, stop doing that. Don't do that. That's very dangerous. I used to like jump down. I had like we, a staircase where I think I would try to jump like from a higher and higher step. And I never hurt myself, but I also didn't go that high. But I definitely now I'm like, oh, if I saw Ollie doing that, I'd be like, don't do that. It's crazy. What are you doing? Um, yeah. That might be, but that's a very specific. <laughs> so I don't know. Yes, I think I'll tell Lolly. I mean, I'll probably drive him crazy with being like, yeah, that's a bad idea. But, I, you know, again, he'll probably have to learn it through his own experiences. Yeah. As a mom of two boys, I can completely uh, relate to that. It's, it's yeah. wild. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eugene, for, for sharing your story, for thank creating you. the documentary. It started as a joke. It is beautiful. Where can our listeners find it and find more about you? Um, they can find it on iTunes, Amazon, and then I think all the other places that people put stuff like that. Um, they can learn more about me. I don't know. I guess they could follow me on Twitter, or Instagram or something. Um, and, uh, they can watch Bob's Burgers. That's, that's the thing they could do. They probably maybe already do it, but who knows? I have to say, that's one of my favorite shows and people probably wouldn't think that about me, but I've been watching it for years and I let my children watch it and they think it's hilarious and I probably shouldn't do that, but I love it and I love you and I think you're fantastic. Thank you very, very much (laughs) for having me on. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you love this episode, please share it out with a friend or on social media. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You just have to hit those five stars. You don't even have to write anything. And uh, as always, make sure that you're subscribed so that you never miss a guided meditation every Wednesday or every Monday, an interview with an amazing guest doing amazing work in the world.